Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to a conversation about the prospects for the sustainable electrified home, where we're going to be digging into some of these top factors that we imagine might be driving change in the residential building space. I'm Jonathan Starr. I'm going to be moderating uh, today's conversation. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, three guests who will bring some experience, some expertise, and I think probably some also some provocative viewpoints to, uh, to, to this conversation. That's that. That's how I'm going to build them up anyway. <laughs> so um, we don't have a lot of time for this. We have 40 minutes. There's a lot to get through. And so I've instructed um, each of our guests to, to provide an introduction to themselves. And it goes as follows. So I'm going to ask them to just you know tell us who you are, which organization, the role, and then describe what you do in three words. Michael, I'm going to start with you. Uh, sure. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. So Michael Mahan, I'm the SVP of Home and Distribution for North America. I lead our residential business here for Schneider. So my three words, I think, would be residential, uh, development, and I'm going to go with dad. Dad. <laughs> that takes a lot of time. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Tracy. Yeah, Tracy Price, uh, founder and CEO of Cumerit, and uh, distributed workforce management, pretty much what we do. Thank you. Vikram. Hello, everyone. Great to see you all here. Uh, I'm Vikram Agarwal, founder and CEO of Energy Sage. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Uh, instead of three words, it's trusted advisor, consumer first, and transparency. It was like seven words, but Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Three thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I thought someone was going to, you know, I heard yesterday someone was going to say, eat, sleep, Schneider, <laughs> something like that. But uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I should have modeled it myself. So I'm Jonathan Starr. Um, I, I run a company called Scenario Insight. And um, I think my three words would, would be, um, uh, help people talk. So that's it. All right, so today's conversation is, um, is really, in, in some ways, the kind of, we're talking about an energy transition. And I mean, there's very, very, very little doubt that we're seeing remarkable changes in how energy is produced and consumed. We're probably on a journey towards um, net zero, zero emissions. And of course, this has so many different kind of impacts and effects. What we're talking about today is what this might mean for the home, what it might mean for building homes, upgrading homes, the kind of behavior and oper operation of kind of homeowners and so on. And of course, what that might mean then for everyone who supports um, those different parts of the process. So what we're really talking about here is as we're seeing changes in energy, what is it that really means a lot to the home? And so I'm going to uh, maybe just give you a little backdrop here. Um, I'm going to echo many of the things that we heard in the, in, in the keynote, but I'll do this kind of very, very briefly. Um, so what's behind this, this kind of energy transition? Well, as we've heard, the climate change situation, climate crisis in many ways, um, you don't have to go far from here to Lake Mead and see what the impact of the, the, the drought is on the Western states. Now, is that caused by climate change? It's certainly intensified by climate change. Um, Hurricane Ian, over the last week or two, um, the impact of a hurricane, they've been with us, they can be intensified by climate change. You can see the glacial melt in Pakistan causing the kind of crazy um, situations that you've seen there. And so there's very little doubt that what, we've, what we are now seeing is far more awareness of the impact on a day-to-day -day basis in the day-to-day -day lives of everyone from climate change. As a result of that, governments are clearly concerned and in getting involved with this. So there's a lot of government investment happening. Um, we'll talk, I'm sure, um, in, the, in this session about the Inflation Reduction Act and all the climate kind of provisions in there. But then even more specifically, you're seeing states um, really kind of putting mandates and regulations in place to mandate, um, okay, it's got to be solar, power, solar in this new building, or you can have gas, you've got to have electric, and so on. So there's this rising demand for electrification and electricity that we're seeing across the board. Some estimates there are saying that you know, close to a 70% increase in home electricity consumption um, over the next couple of decades. As we're seeing that rising demand, 
that has to be put in the context of the fact that we're seeing um, a, an aging infrastructure and problems and kind of and constraints with the grid and the resilience of that. We've all had experience, whether it be through um, extreme heat or wintry weather or other load factors that are basically creating situations where we're seeing outages happening for much more of our time um, in our homes. And it's not just a case of maintaining, maintaining a grid for the new demand. It's like, how do you improve? How do you ensure that you've got a resilient grid for the future? And of course, underpinning all of this is the push towards kind of the aggressive and ambitious decarbonization goals, whether that be in the US, Europe, China, and other places. Biden administration, they're setting a goal to kind of cut emissions by 50% by 2030. So these are in many ways, and then I haven't mentioned digitization and other things, but these are really the drivers of the energy transition um, that we're seeing. But in this thread, we're gonna be talking about homes. So Michael, I'm gonna turn to you first and um, uh, maybe ask you a question about where you see all of this taking us. Um, maybe paint us a picture for 10 years, 15 years time. Um, <laughs> What's the home of the future looking like? Yeah, and, and I, I think in many ways we're starting to, to see it in this moment right now. So I, I think the home of the future 10 years from now, it's going to be smarter. It's going to be more sustainable. And we're going to be more thoughtful about the material makeup of the things that go in it. So, so what do I mean by that? Uh, all of us have smart home devices all over our home. They, they track our energy consumption. They, they manage our lights. They manage our plumbing. And it's, it's new for many of the people here in the room, but we're all quite excited about it. The generations that follow us, it's table stakes. So, you know, when my kids go to grandma house and Amazon doesn't turn the lights on, they think the house is broken. And, <laughs> and this is increasingly gonna be what people expect. It is expected that the future home is gonna be smart and that's gonna include energy. So homes will be smarter. They'll be more sustainable in how they produce the energy. So, you know, Vikram's gonna talk about it, but the solar uptake in the US right now is massive being led by states like California and Texas and, and Florida and Massachusetts. And so how we generate energy is gonna change. And in some cases, we're gonna store that energy on site and be able to ride through some of these service disruptions that we talked about. And then the last one that maybe isn't energy related but is sustainable related is I think we're all just gonna get a lot more thoughtful about the content of the stuff coming into our homes. Is it made in a sustainable way? Is it reducing wasted materials? Is it getting rid of single-use plastics? You know, I, I had a moment during the pandemic, I'm, I'm sure all of you had a moment like this, where you know, we had basically converted all of our pur purchases to online purchases. And at the end of the week, you would go out on the back porch and you would look at the, you know, it was like the Fraggle Rock trash monster back there of just broken down boxes and pieces of plastic and bags. And, and I just felt really I felt really bad about it. I, I felt like I, I wasn't being thoughtful about kind of the waste I was putting into the world. And I think you're starting to see people get a lot more serious about that. So that's my view for the home of the future. It'll be smarter, it'll be more sustainable, and we'll be more thoughtful about the waste and the products that you're putting inside your home. Okay, great. Michael, thank you. Vikram, I'm gonna turn to you next, and Tracy, I'll come back to you. Vik Vikram, um, Two, two questions to you. One, I'd love you to maybe respond to, to Michael here and almost give your view as well. Do you agree in terms of you know, the picture of the home of the future? Is there anything you would add? And then also, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, okay, we're talking about a transition. What's needed, what do homeowners need, let's say, to support such a transition to the home of the future? So kind of two, two parts answer there, or a two-part two question at least. Um, your views on Michael's, and then talk a little bit about what you think n is needed for that transition. And we only have 30 minutes to talk about that? Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll yeah, we have 31 <laughs> left at the moment, we're all good. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I uh, very much agree with what Michael is saying, and I'll, I think, jump to the next question, and because my answers are very similar to the sentiment that you are, that you're sharing. So, we just actually completed a pretty big consumer research. As, as uh, I don't know if folks know what Energy Sage does, but we are a marketplace for consumers, for homeowners and commercial property owners to learn and comparison shop for energy products and services. So we very much focus our attention on really understanding what the consumer is looking for. 
uh, and I, I hope everybody agrees, all of us are trying to do one thing, is to serve the consumer best, right? Be really consumer centric. So what we are finding is that consumers are excited about their, their homes becoming smarter, but they are still not fully informed and educated about what, what the hell does that mean, right? So when you are, when you are talking to consumers and saying, hey, let's, they, you, are, you are trying to make your home, I, I think there are four decisions that are driving consumer decisions in this space. Number one, I bet we all recognize this, is I want to save money. My energy costs are rising, and recently they have risen really fast whether it's uh, oil, uh, gasoline for your car or electricity for your home or home heating oil or gas, gas prices, right? So prices are rising, so consumers are very focused on how do I save money? Then the next three reasons why consumers are thinking about this, and that differs by the customer segments that you are focusing on, is I want to live sustainably, I want to be more resilient, and I want my homes to be more comfortable, right? And when you are talking about different customer segments, when you talk to millennials or Gen X or uh, the, the new generation that's coming our way, all of those different customer segments are placing different weightage to those three elements. But number one reason by a large margin is I want to save money. Right? So that's, that's one. The second is now I think consumers are also telling us that they are lacking consumer education. They're lacking education and understanding of all these complexities. Smart home is not gonna be easy, right? These are complex decisions. These are big ticket items. And people really don't understand their options. They don't have full confidence in all the solutions that are being presented to them. So consumer education is going to be very much needed to give people comfort and help them make this transition uh, over a period of time. All right, Vikram, thanks very much. Tracy, let me ask you the, the, the same question, also if there's anything in reaction to what Michael said about the vision of the kind of home of the future, but then also as this transition happens, Vikram, you've stated consumer education, that kind of lack of information being quite a, quite a, quite a big part of this. Um, Tracy, talk about um, the role of Qmerit and what problem you think you're solving there for homeowners. Sure, uh, well, first of all, relative to the electrification of the home of the future, I think if inflation keeps a pace, um, we're all going to be living in our EVs. So it'll be 100% <laughs> electric. So I, I think we're in good shape there. Oh, God, Tracy. <laughs> we'll talk later about risk. We, yeah, we that's right. <laughs> um, but, you know, really the complexity is the opportunity, uh, much to, to the point Vikram brought up. And what we see is, you know, an unbelievable opportunity to demystify that on behalf of the consumer and the multifamily property. Uh, the, the issue that we see and that we try and resolve and solve is there's an acute shortage of competent qualified labor to actually do this work. So, you know, if you're a contractor, uh, and I told people if, if I had kids that, that, uh, that were not going to college, I'd say become an electrician. I mean, there, there's, that's the biggest no-brainer on the planet. It's an unbelievable opportunity and the pace of change is way over the head of the consumer. It's way over the head of, of the commercial customer. Uh, I did all these things to myself at my home, and by the time I was done with the journey, I was exhausted. By the time I got permission to operate, I was like, holy crap, you know, this, <laughs> this was not easy and it was not fun. So, you know, if there's a, uh, today a current shortfall of probably 200,000 electricians in the US and electrification is just now exploding, you know, I don't know where that backfill is going to come from. So it's great that, that there's all kinds of new technologies and widgets and products and, and uh, potential to integrate and be sustainable and resilient, but it doesn't install itself, it doesn't maintain itself, it doesn't program itself, and it doesn't change itself out if it dies. So, you know, that labor force to me is everything. That is the long pole in the tent. So, you know, in our world, what we try and do is, you know, onboard, educate, promote, align, you know, create outcomes uh, and, and do it in, in a way that's very contractor centric. So, you know, people who know us know that we've been in this basically distributed labor world, uh, both turning the wrenches and managing subcontractors and franchisees and retirees and gig labor for uh, close to 30 years. And the problem's never been different, it's just more acute now. And that creates opportunity for the guys who are the strivers and achievers. So to me, it's a, it's a perfect storm. And you know, the name of our company, Cumerit, was 
you know, we have all these jobs going in the queue and we wanted to distribute the work based on a meritocracy. So if people say, how come I'm not getting more jobs? It's like, well, maybe you price more rigorously, you do a better job, you get better uh, CSAT scores and your MPS is higher, you know, the, the world's your oyster. So uh, I just think there's boundless opportunity and, and that's why, you know, we're excited about, about our relationship with Schneider. Great. Tracy, thanks very much. And uh, we'll come back to talking about support for installers and contractors and things in, in a moment or two. But it's really interesting just to see the, the, the thoughts here around the importance of demystification and education in a very kind of complex situation. So, so one aspect, I'm going to, Vikram, I'm, I'm going to go to you first, Michael, I'm going to come back to you then. Um, one of the things that's in some ways changed and potentially accelerated this transition over recent months is some of the government incentives and uh, the passing of the Inflation Reduction Act, particularly with a lot of climate provisions in there. Um, Vikram, I'll turn to you first. What impact do you think it's gonna have um, on homeowners and then also on the overall kind of support that we've been talking about here? Is it a big deal? It is a very big deal. Uh, so we, as I just mentioned, we finished a very large consumer study last week. And one of the questions, one of the areas of focus was to ask people, do you know about the IRA? Uh, and do you care about <laughs> what's in the IRA? Uh, there's good news, bad news. Uh, I think about 40, 45% of the respondents said, yes, we do understand, we do, uh, we have been keeping track of the IRA and actually are excited and it will drive my decision, decision to adopt more solar, batteries, EVs, home electrification, um, and uh, et cetera. But 55% said, I have no idea what the hell is mm. the IRA, right? And how is it going to impact? So again, coming back to that consumer education, really helping people understand what's in the IRA is a big challenge for us. Uh, the great thing is it's a, it's a excellent piece of legislation. It's very thoughtful. It's very comprehensive. It helps consumers through the full electrification journey and say, hey, we understand that if you are going to install solar and batteries and buy an EV, maybe install heat pumps, you're gonna need an upgraded electrical system. So we'll uh, give you rebates and incentives and tax credits to make that happen. Uh, and also, if you are going to electrify, maybe you need to make your building envelope more energy efficient. So there is provisions for insulation and upgraded windows, uh, et cetera. So it's a really good piece of legislation. It's not done yet. There is plenty of work still needs to be done at the state level. Now the states are taking over and starting to define the different rebates by income categories, by price of products and such. So there's a lot more complexity that is about to come, come our way. So the challenge for consumer education goes up even more, uh, helping really people understand what are they gonna pay? How much money are they gonna save? And remember, their biggest decision criteria is financial savings. Mm. So, Helping consumers understand will be a key, uh, Great. key need. Michael, do you, do you share Vikram's optimism and kind of uh, positive feelings about uh, the potential for the IRA? Yeah, and, and look, I think Vikram hit on it. There's lots of reasons people choose to make their home more sustainable, but number one with the bullet is cost savings usually. That, that's why people look at it. Uh, the first time you have a six or $700 electric bill, you will suddenly start to get real interested in solar powering your home and things like that. And the IRA just shaves massive cost off tons of these projects. So it, it's 30% solar credit uh, for doing a solar install, now inclusive of any electrical upgrades that you wanna do, which used to be kind of carved out, now inclusive of a battery. If you wanna add a battery, there's incentives for the battery. There's increased incentives uh, for purchasing electric vehicles. If you happen to be in certain income categories, you can get a $4,000 upfront rebate for the, any electrification work that you have to do in your home. So it's real dollars that makes the attractivity of these projects much stronger, I think, for the homeowner. So I, I'm, I am real optimistic about it. Now, I, I do think that we have the same challenge that Vikram highlighted, which, you know, we all do this for a living, and who can give me the 10 facts about the Inflation Reduction Act and how it impacts your business? Probably not many. Uh, it's confusing. And, and so we have to help folks and explain to folks what the benefits are, what the opportunities are. And it, there's a real lot of kind of customer education to be done around the benefits. The other thing that is nice about it is we have existed in this space, and, and Tracy and Vikram know it pretty well, 
where it's, you know, will the credits get re-upped? Will they get shut off? Will they get re-upped? Will they get shut off? This has been kind of the past 20 years. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act pegs most of these credits through 2032, I think, right? It, it's a solid 10-year, you can predict kind of a business environment that you have to operate in for the next decade. And I think that predictability for those of us that run businesses or are kind of building new, new businesses around this area, I think that's really helpful as well. So mm -hmm. I'm optimistic about it. I think it was the right piece of legislation and I think it's really gonna do something for the home in the future. Yeah. Tracy, your view on, uh, on, on IRA, are you, are you seeing kind of impact in the, in the marketplace at the moment, are you, in the conversations that you're having? Uh, I think the conversations are generally confusing uh, today. And, you know, you, you had four or five different constituents that were all trying to capture the homeowner or the consumer, whether it was the utility or the auto OEM or Siri, Alexa, and Google uh, Assistant. You've got cable companies uh, that are going to provide a, a free level two charger with every panoramic Wi-Fi box. You know, there are multiple constituents all fighting over that customer mind share. And who's going to get the managed charging? Who's going to do the aggregation? Who's going to get the carbon credits? You know, there's, there are so many of these uh, discussions taking place. And then IRA comes in, drops the big stone in the middle of the calm Ripple. pond of water, and everybody's scrambling. It's like, you know, we had a business plan. Oh, crap. Now what? And so I think the consumer is going to benefit when people figure out how to maximize the opportunity created by, by the IRA. Uh, but I don't know that the big players have necessarily figured that out yet. And there's going to be a lot of squabbling and sword fighting and, and a lot of marketing that's going to say incredible things about what this is going to do for you. And then when you get down into the weeds, you're going to go, what the hell did I just do? Um, so I, I think... Again, back to simplification, demystifying, and, and having some cogent marketing messaging is hugely important. Um, and and it, you know, that much money can't, can't but help uh, move the, uh, the industry forward. It's just how much of it is going to go to places where it really isn't going to have impact versus direct point of service, point of cut consumer uh, opportunities. That's TBD. Okay. All right. Thanks. So we've talked a lot about... Um, the, the demystification, the fact that homeowners are going to need help transitioning through this. And your last point, Tracy, there, you know, the boulder's been dropped into the pond, there's ripples all over the place. Um, I'd like to talk about installers, contractors, everyone who we kind of touch on a day-to-day -day basis. What support is needed there? for the transition that we're talking about. You know, what, 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 what's your experience of thinking, okay, we can paint the picture of what's going on, it's exciting, um, there's you know, difficulties all over the place, but you know, we're, we're, we're moving forward in this way. What's gonna help installers and contractors and others really take advantage of the opportunities here? Vikram, I'll go to you first on that. Sure. Uh, so it's similar, I think the, this is great news if you are in the business today. I think as Tracy's laying out, there is, the opportunity is unlocked. That said, again, referring back, uh, these are big ticket items. And consumers are, while they're interested, they're going to take action over the next several years. It's not going to be a package decision, right? If you are buying solar, it's $20,000. If you're adding a battery, it's another 10, 15, 20,000, depending on what you're looking for. Now you're buying an electric car, another anywhere from 30 to, is there an upper limit? Uh, so th these, are, these are big ticket items, heat pumps, another big ticket item. So these, as consumers jump into this journey, I think the contractors will have to guide them through this journey, right? If you're going with a big package, how many of the households will be able to afford that package day one versus, hey, I'm gonna start with one product then next year, I'm going to do the next project. Then next year, I'm going to do the next project. So now you are jumping into a relationship with your customer for the next several years. Maybe you are, you are fully um, capable of delivering all that value, or maybe you have to start partnering with others and bringing that value to the consumer and helping them through the journey. So, Okay, so that in some ways, you're, you're seeing this as being a realization for for contractors and installers that this the, it's not one off relation it's not it's not one off transactions it's not anymore. one off transactions very much a kind of more of a relationship that you're seeing there with homeowners and other customers um, 
Michael, what, what about you? What are you seeing in terms of the kind of the different capabilities and approaches that might be needed by contractors and installers um, in this kind of crazy, exciting time? Yeah, so I, if I could give a piece of advice to contractors and installers, I, I pick stuff that works. Uh, these, <laughs> these, are, these are heavy upfront sales to kind of consult and explain to a homeowner exactly what you're gonna do and how this is gonna install and the benefits it's gonna give. You're, you're, you're not just selling, you're really doing customer education at the same time as selling. And I'm sure it feels great when you do a whole bunch of customer education and they say, thank you for explaining that to me, I'm gonna go with someone else. So I, I understand it, it's tough on the front end. What you don't wanna do is also make it tough on the back end, which is you've installed the product, you've set it up, you've walked away, uh, and now you get a phone call every other Tuesday about you know how come this isn't connecting or this dropped off and this piece isn't talking to that piece efficiently and it's not working. So I, I think you've got to have an eye towards picking solutions and systems that are well integrated, that talk to each other, and that take some of that complexity of operation out of this. It is really cool to think about, I'm gonna have solar panels on the roof, I'm gonna be getting energy from the grid, sometimes I'll use a battery, I'm gonna charge my car, maybe my car will charge my house. That is really cool but 99% of your customers would just like the light switch to turn on and for it to be cheap when it does so. They actually don't need to understand everything that's happening behind the scenes. So I think you've got to partner with providers and manufacturers that are trying to make systems that take an incredibly complex thing like that and try to make it seem very simple and clean and easy to the homeowner. And then hopefully every time you do one of these houses, if you're going back, it's to do what Vikram describes. It's to add a heat pump, it's to add a battery, it's to add some more panels. It's not you're going back to explain for the seventh time how to operate the system because that, that's just not an efficient way to run your business. Yeah. Tracy, you obviously work with installers on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you, uh, do you agree with Vikram and Michael or, or are there, is there anything else to add that you'd say, here's what I think is different, let's say, about the, the way in which contractors or installers have to operate in the next 10 years compared to maybe what they've done in the past? Yeah, you know, I'd say first of all, relative to the phone calls with multiple problems, I had no idea my wife had your number. <laughs> <laughs> she, is, she is on that. So. Um, yeah, I, I would say that uh, for contractors, the, the tail wagging the dog is unit volumes and uh, vehicles, period. Uh, electrification is about the car. America is a car crazy country. There's 105 models coming out in the next 12 months. Uh, we have contracts with virtually every auto manufacturer not named Tesla for a reason because I said they're Apple. We're going after uh, uh, the other operating system, the Android, and every single one of the auto OEMs said, I like that model. Uh, reality is, as you see unit volumes increasing, people start focusing on what else they can do electrically in the home. And when we talk about this from a California-centric standpoint, you know, load management is great, uh, sensing what's going on in the home and turning things on and off is great, but we have customers with three EVs, all right? And so it's a panel upgrade, it is load management, it's, it's all the things that come with it. But when I look at, at uh, what's the catalyst for this whole movement, it's been the electric vehicle starting to cross the chasm. And, Two years ago when you saw a Super Bowl commercial with an EV, you were like, oh, that's cute. They're talking about Norway. Uh, now, I mean, you, you can't watch a sporting event without seeing 15 commercials about all the, you know, the muscle trucks and the cool cars and, and everything that's coming. And, and I can tell you just from, from the way people engage, there's a different customer for the electric vehicle and home electrification. I tell everybody the weight of the customer is hardest through the garage. And in deference to Vikram, I say it's not through the roof. <laughs> but, you know, when you bundle it, it becomes very compelling. I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff. And once, once you have bi-directional that's fully functional and you have managed charging and you have battery nodes running all over the place and, you know, so many use cases and technology, it's going to be great fun. But the next 10 years is going to be an amazing build based on a car. And, you know, being an electric vehicle owner, I, I have a window into what works and what doesn't work, and I happen to be a big fan of charging at home because I tell people it's like your iPhone. Uh, you may top it off at work or at the airport, but you like it when you go home at night and you wake up in the morning, you got a full charge. So 
for, for the business use cases, in discussions with Microsoft and others, we said, hey, what are you gonna do with a thousand fully charged cars that descend on your campus? Mm. Now, that could be fun. But really, I, I think as unit volumes increase, supply chain issues ebb, you're gonna see all of these home automation activities, integration to solar, battery storage, all that stuff is going to just ramp dramatically because you've got the organizing principle and people are, are, are driving it and touching it every day. Yeah, really interesting as you say that sense of just being driven by car culture and the EV being in, in many ways the kind of killer app here as to, as to, as to driving this. Um, like you, I, I, I have an EV and I installed a home charger two months ago, changed everything. Not, uh, not, not having to kind of scrabble around for Electrify America or things like that, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a romantic notion to charge in the wild, but it's just that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, a um, couple more questions before we, before we wrap up here. We've been talking about, as you say, exciting times, lots of opportunity um, uh, going on. I wanna talk about risks, um, and whether this is risks in the short term or risks in the longer term. It, it, it's pointless going into this journey without full kind of foresight or knowledge of, well, what could go wrong? What do we need to be aware of? What do we need to be looking out for that we can then um, maybe head off or, or certainly adapt as we see difficulties ahead? Um, Michael, let me start with you. Uh, what, 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 could, what could derail our optimism and the excitement that we're talking about right now? Nobody buys this stuff. Hmm. It, it, it's, it's pretty simple, right? So it, there's 100 plus vehicle models coming out. There's solar incentives. There's all the stuff is out there. But if consumers don't make the decision to go buy it, then everything else we've talked about is kind of academic. So we've got to do our job to make sure that it, it's easy for them to understand and it's easy to make a yes purchase decision, right? So I think that's the biggest risk, is that the consumer enthusiasm, because they maybe feel overwhelmed by the complexity, it dampens that enthusiasm. And then the other risk I would throw in there, and, and I just think it's, it's all of our job as you know, good citizens to make sure this doesn't happen. If somehow this topic of sustainability or electric cars or, or solar in your house or everything else falls into our very toxic culture war in this country, uh, and it becomes a a, a marker, an indicator of a political opinion one way or the other, uh, we're all dead. And, and we can't let that happen, which by the way, it's nonsense that it would happen. It's good for all of us. This is, this is great for the country. If we can make our homes more resilient, if we can wean ourselves off of foreign energy, this is great for all of us. We can't let this fall into kind of your traditional, I think, culture war type stuff that we sometimes fall victim to in the country. So I, those I think are the two biggest risks. Consumers get overwhelmed and don't pull the trigger on purchasing, and this somehow falls into our, you know, traditional unhealthy red versus blue dynamic in this country. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, and on, on that first one, I guess there's you you referenced it in some ways as people don't buy this stuff. It sounded a little more sort of structural in terms of this could happen over the long term. I guess there's also risks if consumer confidence kind of goes down and so on, just you know, the thoughts of a recession. That's something that you could see on the short term as well being a danger there. Yeah, and, and I, I think you know, all of the companies that are making the new cars, that are making the solar panels, that are making the inverters and the batteries, uh, they're all gonna respond to market signals. So everyone's piling into this space now, and, and you can pick up the, the journal every morning and you can read an announcement from a new company that's entering the home electrification space. Well, if nobody buys it, they're all gonna pile right out of it and go do something else. And then that's gonna have the, kind of the spiral effect of it limits consumer choice, it takes the available options down. So it, the market's gotta be successful by us helping consumers feel good about buying this stuff. Because if enough time goes by, and it doesn't happen, then companies will start making decisions to put resources and investments in other places, and, and none of us want that to happen, so. Very good. Vikram, what, what are you watching out for? Yeah, a number, number of things, uh, maybe a couple to start with. Number one, to just add to what you're saying, our consumer is gonna buy. Our industry, this industry, is still largely a push market we need to convert that into a pull market where the consumers are really excited and asking for these products. I think a lot of us know in this room, over the last decade, seven out of the largest 10, largest 10 solar companies have gone out of business. 
Guess why? Customer acquisition costs were too high because it was a demand push driven, sorry, push driven marketing versus a demand pull driven marketing which reduces customer acquisition costs. So that is a very big risk. Number two is, as, as I was talking about earlier, that people are going to make these decisions over the next several years. So are we building, and Michael, we have talked about this, is it, are we building open architecture platforms or are we building closed architecture platforms? What that means is, if the consumer has decided, I'm gonna make, let's say, I'm gonna install solar first, maybe EV first. <laughs> uh, let's say if they do install solar first, they I pick, like this dynamic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're gonna, we're gonna duke it out later. <laughs> uh, so let's say you go with a solar pa brand of solar panel and a brand of inverter. Are all your future decisions now closed? Now you have to pick the same brand of batteries, the same brand, or whatever batteries work with that particular brand. That's a closed architecture system. So that will limit consumer choice. We are already seeing that. A lot of consumers reach out to us asking if they can upgrade their systems. Uh, and a lot of cases, it's not possible. Uh, because these are closed architecture systems. So the hope is we keep an open architecture platform so that these decisions can be made easier for the consumer over the long, over their journey. Okay, thanks, Vikram. Tracy, your thoughts on uh, what makes, you know, in the excitement of this transition, what are you watching out for and you think we've got to be wary of the following if it plays out as a risk? Yeah, I, I think uh, first and foremost, you know, we've got to get past just uh, marketing to the true believers. You know, that, that's kind of easy. The, the biggest problem in this industry is there's no brand. And in deference to Schneider, I guess I pissed everybody off on the panel today. Um, there's no brand, okay? So if you go to a, a homeowner today and you say, hey, I want to put in battery storage and this and that, there's no diehard, ever-ready Duracell. They're like, okay, what's an email? What's a EA? What's a charge point? What? They have no clue. So a lot of people invaded the space when the bigger players pulled back. And now the real companies like Schneider are coming in, and so there's an opportunity there to establish the trusted brand in the space that, again, is a bundle that facilitates a lot of the things these, these uh, homeowners uh, are gonna wanna do. But the bigger problem is still, if you don't have the, the troops to do the implementation, if you don't have the army at the ready, it doesn't matter, okay? And so, I think the biggest risk is if the contractors don't see it as real and they don't see it going from true believer to pragmatic you know, citizen at large, uh, they're not gonna train up their people, they're not gonna spend the money, they're not gonna, they're not gonna take dollars off the table because the guy could be installing you know, electrical, or, you know, a ceiling fan or something to go, do, to go learn about complex electrification measures. And, and that's really, to me, the gating issue because the homeowner is so conditioned, you know, Michael made the comment about all those boxes out in the back of his house, you know, they got me upset when it was like Tiffany's and Gucci. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, you, know, you, you make the comment about um, how much of this can be, can be acquired remotely and what the consumer has been conditioned for and that is, I go buy an electric vehicle, I click my mouse twice, and all the rest of this gets installed. Okay, that is such a massive disconnect from reality between load calcs and permits and panel upgrades and, and permission to operate and all these things. So you gotta get it to the point where it's a shrink wrap deal where the consumer can just hit one button and their expectations can be met because right now they can't be. There's not enough workforce to do it. So that to me is the, is the biggest risk is you start disappointing people on a grand scale because the time between them getting a car and actually having something that they can charge with in their home becomes months uh, because of, of the explosion in the number of vehicles. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's my biggest fear. Uh, the rest of it, I think technology wise will, will orient itself. There will be an emerging brand uh, it will get easier to buy, but right now everybody's fighting for their piece of the puzzle and they don't really understand that, that the, the gating issue is, is really labor. Right. Great, thanks. And it, 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 it also, Tracy, I'm hearing you talk and, and thinking about the way in which what we have 
here up on stage are different players in the ecosystem. And what you're talking about there is how, how that emerges, how the ecosystem, how people start to collaborate together, who grows, how that happens. So it, 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 it moves away from that fragmentation. I think it's going to be important. All right, we've got less than a minute to go. Um, and I'm going to ask maybe just for one kind of final takeaway from each of you, just in terms of um, one thing the players in this business really need to kind of be paying attention to as we're managing this transition. Maybe 10 seconds each. What's your takeaway, Vikram, on this? Consumer first. <laughs> let's, let's respect the consumer and help them, help them find solutions. All right, Tracy. Yeah, I just think ease of acquisition is, is the critical piece because there are so many stakeholders that all want a piece of this puzzle and nobody's bundled it together and financed it and made it affordable over time. And that's, that's a big one. All right, Michael. Uh, I think someone said it earlier, demystification. So one of the best things I think about American culture is every year we expect our lives to be a little bit more convenient than it was last year. That is just a base level assumption for most Americans. The opportunity is to help this stuff feel like that. If it feels more complex than it did last year, if it feels harder than when I just used to be hooked up to the grid and driving a fossil fuel car, we've all failed. So I think the opportunity for all of us is to kind of be those, those folks that will guide you through this process and to make it feel easier to the homeowner, will make it feel less complex than it was yesterday. And that's where I think the real, the real magic can happen. All right, Michael, thank you. Michael. Tracy Vikram, please join me in thanking um, our panel this morning. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for listening. There's plenty of other uh, sessions on the home thread that you'll, uh, you'll see throughout the next couple of days. You can learn more about the home of the future up at the Innovation Hub. I'm sure many of you have been there. Um, we're going to wrap this up now. I know there's um, community microgrid session starting pretty soon in here, I think. So uh, thanks again for your, uh, for, for your time this morning, and I hope you found this a valuable conversation. Thanks all. Have a good couple of days.